Good afternoon and welcome to the State Library of Victoria and to the latest in the OWL online collections webinar series. So my name's Andrew and today I'm joined by Tom and Marcus and we're librarians with the Digital Access and Family History team. And today our theme is internet research with a particular emphasis on Google. So we're looking for, to offer some tips as to how you might get the best and most reliable information from Google. So we welcome your questions during the session and immediately below your screen, you'll see the Slido forum. If you click on that, that'll open in a separate tab and you can pop any questions in there and we'll uh, attempt to answer them at the end of the session. Uh, also, if you're using a, another device, perhaps a mobile phone or a tablet, and you want to access Slido from there, just go to slido.com and for the event code, put in our online collections as one word, but each of the words just start with a capital, so our online collections. So while today we're talking about finding free information on the internet, I also just wanted to let you know that you can also find a massive amount of information that's not available freely on the internet, but is delivered via the internet through subscription databases. And as your state's reference and research library, we subscribe to a large number of those databases and they give access to literally millions of journal and newspaper articles. And if you're living in Victoria, all you have to do to share that access to get access to our subscriptions is click on the become a member link up here and it'll take you about three minutes to fill out the details and we'll send you a barcode number. So as we move down the screen, the other thing I'll point out is that we do have a lot of videos and we have done a number in this series of our online collections. And if you click on view all stories, you can see previous episodes of this particular webinar. And then if you go right down the bottom, we've got an Ask a Librarian link. So if you're doing some research and you get a little bit stuck or you just need a bit of advice, go to Ask a Librarian and one of our librarians will offer you some help and see if we can give you get you uh, going along with your research. Um, but as I say, today we're going to Google and we're going to hand over to Tom to tell us just how Google does the searches. Thanks, Andrew. All right, I'll just bring up Google. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview about how Google works uh, and uh, yeah, give you an idea about um, some of the, I suppose, the secrets behind Google um, or what we know about them anyway. So um, I'm sure everyone's familiar with Google. Uh, it's how most people get their information on the internet or search for things. And Google collects pretty much everything it can. So it sends out web crawls, which it uses to collect information from websites, so the content as well as information about websites, and then organizes them into an index, which is the, the Google search index. So Google search index includes hundreds of billions of um, websites uh, and the size of the, the index is around 100 million gigabytes. So it's a huge amount of information that Google has to kind of organize and sort through every time you put through a search query. So Google, um, you can see here, we're looking at the Google homepage. And down in the bottom left-hand corner, there's a link here that says how search works. So if I click on this link, you'll get an overview from Google uh, about how things kind of function. So under the first tab here, organizing information, you'd be able to read a little bit about web crawlers and how Google collects information and how it organizes it. Um, but I'm probably gonna talk more about this second tab here or, or Google search algorithms. So an algorithm is a, a set of rules or processes uh, and Google use their search algorithms in terms of returning the search results when you put in a question or a query. And it also determines the ranking or the order that those results are returned in. Uh, so if we scroll down here, Google have provided five different elements that they uh, kind of use to explain how their algorithm works. And the first few are fairly straightforward forward, the kind of meaning of your query, relevance of web pages, content, uh, quality of content and usability of web pages. But I think it's interesting to note under this fifth one here, context and settings, they also talk about uh, personalization. So uh, it's uh, useful to remember when then you put a, a search into Google, it's using other contextual information such as your location or possibly as well um, your search history or other information that Google knows about you to personalize your results. So what you get returned as results from Google might be slightly different from somebody else, depending on um, 
their context and what Google knows as well, and depending on the search query that you enter. Um, so Google um, kind of lists these five elements, but in fact, it would probably many hundreds of elements that go into making um, the decisions around what search results are returned. So it's a very complex system that Google uses and Google don't explain it in any great depth or share in detail, um, details about their algorithm. It's not something that's transparent that other people can kind of analyze and look at. So it's a bit of a black box. So it, it's a mystery in certain ways. And that's partly because that's important for their company and how they make money. Um, so the other thing, keeping in mind as well, that Google individually and collectively um, collects lots of data about people and that informs how their search works, but it also informs things like advertising, which is how Google makes mm -hmm. money. All right, so that's um, kind of a bit of an overview. I'll go back to a Google search and we'll type in something here uh, to have a look at a search page. So put in who was Marie Curie. So there's quite a bit of information that comes up when you um, put in a Google search. Um, so Google kind of have, if you've seen in the news, would have there's been accusations of bias in Google and many other search engines by people from around the world at various times. And Google's response to this usually is that um, their algorithms are neutral, but it's important to uh, understand what that means as well. So um, when Google collects information, they just kind of collect whatever's available, but it means that uh, the information that's put on the web is also reflected back through our searches. So any biases that are in society or in the content that's kind of pre predominantly online will be reflected in what um, Google kind of returns as well in some way. So that's important to keep in mind. And the other thing, like Andrew mentioned at the beginning, um, different from Google versus other databases that the library has is the library's databases are curated by or selected by people where Google, it's all entirely done through these algorithms. So these boxes here that you see, there's a whole lot of information here about Marie Curie. Um, and some of them you can see where the information's come from. So they've this, given this source of this, this little snippet. And that's, um, yeah, been selected by Google based upon other people's searching behaviors. So that's all right, because you can kind of analyze this result here and kind of question the authority of that, that source. If you look at some of these other sources, um, there's no information really about where this information's come from. So it's always good to keep in mind when you're looking at search results from Google, particularly at the top few, is like uh, questioning the, where the results are and making sure you're comfortable with the level of authority that's included. So a couple of other things to keep in mind that are helpful. Um, I'll do another quick search here. So we look at headaches, um, scroll down. If you have a look at uh, the URL of some web pages, we'll give you some information about that authority. So if it says a .gov means it's a govern web, government website and .eu means it's an education website. So they can be helpful indicators, but I'll, uh, Andrew will go into that more shortly. One last note before I uh, finish in kind of explaining how Google's information is laid out and decided upon. So you can see here, with medical information slightly different. They've actually got a more detail of attribution here. Um, and these pieces of information are actually reviewed by people compared to with these snippets, which are all generated through their Google's algorithms. So the main thing to keep in mind is Google focuses on usability and convenience, uh, which is very good if you're looking for uh, some quick information, trying to find a restaurant or something like that, but it's not always the most useful if you're looking for authoritative sources. So I'll hand back to Andrew now and he'll uh, give you a bit more detail about the Google advanced search and how you can find more authoritative sources using Google. Okay, thanks very much, Tom. Um, yeah, so let's go back into the Google search screen. And as Tom said, I'm gonna look at advanced search, which is a feature that I actually like. And as Tom also said, um, Google is fantastic for brief convenient pieces of information. Uh, what are the hours of the local restaurant? Um, I need to get a train, what time are the trains going? That type of information, it's fantastic at that. Um, but it really relies on your capacity to search if you want more detailed information on a broader range of subjects. So 
uh, where something's not very easily defined, then it's really up to you to try and work out ways to define it in a way that brings back results that you can actually use. So as you see, the advanced search is nowhere to be seen there on that page. But if I do any sort of search, I will then get the option to turn it into an advanced search. So say I'm doing research on the social impacts of gambling. And what I'm actually looking for is not a paragraph in a web page. I'm actually looking for some uh, serious research, uh, some high level research and some, some substantial research. So I think the Google basic search always encourages you to do a very basic search. So if I was starting this, I'd probably just put in something like this, um, gambling, and then maybe social uh, effects, impacts perhaps. And you'll see Google's uh, offering me all sorts of um, alternatives to that search, um, just anticipating what I might be looking for. But I'll do that search there. And uh, Tom pointed out just the vastness of Google and that's brought back a, a mere 8.7 million results. Now I'm probably not gonna look through all of those. So what I will probably need to do, and there'll be some good results amongst these first few pages, but I really wanna focus my search a bit more. So under settings, you do get the opportunity to go into advanced search and it just puts your search into uh, the appropriate box. But what I'm going to do first is I'm going to move impacts down here to any of those words and I'll add in something else. I'll think, well, what else, what other words might be used? And I'll think, well, it might be social effects, for example. Um, so what the, I'm doing now is I'm in effect doing two searches. So I'm doing the social impacts of gambling and the social effects of gambling. That's gonna be a pretty broad search. But then I need to think to myself, well, where am I likely to find that information? Who's likely to have produced really substantial and reliable reports on that? And immediately I'd think, well, social welfare agencies will probably have commissioned reports. So they'd be .org.au. Um, and I'm actually looking for this material in Australia. So that's important as well. And the other body is obviously government. So both at the federal, the state and the local level, they will uh, commission a whole range of reports. They get a huge amount of expert advice. Now, governments don't always take expert advice and there's a whole lot of other factors that come into how that advice is implemented. But the original reports are usually very strong. They're written by people who are experts in the field and they're subject to enormous scrutiny. So therefore, um, they're very harshly judged if the research can be picked apart. So it's really in the interest of the people doing the report and in their reputation that those reports are really good. So let's put in gov.au. And then it's a very simple search. I've only put in three things so far. And the last thing I'm going to do is decide on format. So really large documents tend to be in PDF, not always, but usually. So I'm gonna say a PDF document because that's, as I say, normally the way that you would expect to see large documents on the web. So that's a pretty simple search. And we click on our advanced search option and see what comes back. Um, well, we've got down to 43,000 results, but that's not really the point. What we really want is to have really good results. The next thing you might choose to do is to decide that you only want fairly recent things. So you can go into this anytime and you can, should be able to put in a custom range. So let's go 2018 and let's go right up to today. Okay, so you'll see it's put the dates in there. So that's the last two and a half years. So I'm likely to find some really good material there. You'll notice up the top there, it's talking about scholarly articles and I won't go into that because Marcus is about to tell us about Google Scholar, which is another really great feature of Google. Um, but I've found some pretty good stuff here, I think, and you'll see all of them are government reports and all of them are PDFs. So if you go down to any one of these, I might choose this one, then you really need to have a look at that report and decide how useful it's going to be. So that one immediately, I can see it's 69 pages. So that's pretty substantial, published in July, 2018. So in terms of the date, that'll be the date it was put up on the internet. But uh, with those type of reports, that'll uh, correlate almost exactly with when the report was released. So it's from a, a Victorian Responsible Gambling Foundation, which is um, certainly receives funding from the government. But the important thing is uh, who wrote it and where do they come from? So this one, it's the University of Melbourne. So I think that's pretty reliable. You've got four academics there. I could choose to look any of them up to check the backgrounds. I can go through the reports. I can look at the sort of references they've used. So basically I think that's gonna be a pretty good report. So that might be one I look at closer, but also I can now change this um, search. As you can see, you can put in these advanced searches within the uh, basic search box. It's just a matter of putting in the operators. So Google always assumes that when you put terms in there, you're looking for all of those terms. So it doesn't put gambling and social, it just assumes you mean gambling and social. But with impacts or effects, you can see it's put in or, so it's only gonna pick out either one of those two words. It doesn't have to have both. 
and then site colon, I can put in part of a site, file type colon, I can put in PDF. And you can do that in basic search. The reason I like advanced search is because it sort of encourages me to think about the search more. It encourages me to um, think about the sort of options that I might have to narrow my search down. But I can then pretty easily, I said before that perhaps .orgs would be the other place you might look. So I can pretty easily change my search to that and just do another search. And that's bringing up a whole different range of reports that have come from usually social welfare organizations. And again, I might include that in my research. Um, it's maintained my date, but maybe I want to change that date. I can do that if I want to. Um, the other thing to remember is that, as I say, ultimately it's up to you to make those judgments. And the same sort of rules applies would to any research, regardless of whether it's online or in print. And that is that you don't ever use a single source um, use multiple sources. You try and verify the veracity of what you're looking at. Maybe you check a few of their references and notes just to make sure they're exactly what they should be. And ultimately, you can find a vast amount of really strong material online. Um, sometimes it just takes a little bit of perseverance. Um, so that's Google Advanced Search. So now I'll pass over to Marcus to tell us a bit about Google Scholar. Thank you, Andrew. And I'll just share my screen here. Okay, so Google Scholar is actually a, um, a separate part of Google. Uh, it operates distinct from the standard Google search. Um, and what it does is it allows you to search across multiple disciplines uh, for scholarly literature in the form of journal articles, uh, theses, books, and abstracts, which typically are coming from academic publishers, professional societies, research databases, and universities. Uh, yeah, and so when we're talking about scholarly literature, uh, we're talking the sort of content that's typically written by researchers who are experts in their field. Often uh, the content will undergo a peer review process. And what that means is that some other experts in the same field have reviewed the content, have suggested some changes, and then ultimately make a recommendation for whether or not that article should be published. Um, and it's also important to note that uh, when you're searching a Google Scholar, you're likely to find content that you won't usually find in a, a standard Google search. So when you are doing searches for this scholarly type of material, uh, you need to go into Google Scholar to do it specifically. So the easiest way to get into there, uh, as Andrew did for uh, Google Advanced, is just to do a straight search for Google Scholar. You can click to open that up. And you'll see that this looks pretty much just like a typical Google, uh, Google screen, uh, if a slightly out of date version. Um, now you do have the option, as Andrew was just talking about with advanced search, that you can go into the Google Scholar advanced search. Uh, but I'm not gonna do that now. I'm just gonna do a bit of a shortcut. I'm gonna do a topic of interest to me at the moment, cattle in art. And then I'm gonna put in plus paintings. And what that means, is that every result must contain the word paintings. So that's forcing paintings to appear. If you wanted to exclude words, you can just use a dash in front of any words to make sure they're excluded. Uh, now you can see here that it's returned a series of results and it will give us some information about where those results are coming from. So here we've got some information about the authors and where the uh, journal uh, was published, sorry, the title of the journal and when it was published. And there's a brief little snippet of the article itself. But if I wanted to find out some more information, I could simply click on the title and that will take me through to JSTOR, which is uh, an academic uh, publisher, an online database, uh, which obviously has a copy of this article available. Now I'll just close that down because I don't want to sign with my institution. Currently, I have the option to read this online for free and JSTOR is offering up to hundred articles for free online at the moment. Ordinarily, outside of the, the COVID situation, they only offer six articles for free per month. So I could read this for free, but if I'd already exhausted those six articles or if this was on another database, um, typically I would have to pay to download and read the full article. They'll only provide a preview for free online. However, if we go back into Google Scholar, you'll see that next to some of these entries, some of the results that have come back, it's pointing to where I can find a PDF version. Now, you'll also see options here, which may say HTML, which just means the contents in a website. In this case, the PDF version, so the, the file format of PDF is available in this article. So if I click on this, that will take me through to a platform called ResearchGate. And you can see here, I've got the full 10 page article that I can download and read. 
Uh, now you might be wondering if that's okay to do in terms of copyright, but if you have a look in the URL, you can see that this article has been posted under the profile of somebody by the name of Aaron Maisel. One of the authors is A.D. Maisel of this article. So it seems to be likely that the author himself has actually posted this article on his own profile to make it available for people to read. However, you may come across, come across an article. Uh, and for example, this one here, Images of War related to Sand Rock Art doesn't have a link next to it. Now, if we click on the title, again, that's gonna take us through to the publisher that has that content available. And if I click to get access to this one, you can see that the only options I have are to purchase either the entire issue or the article, this particular article. Um, and unfortunately, academic publishing can be quite expensive, but there are other options that we can try without having to pay for this content. As Andrew mentioned, as a member of the State Library, you get access to all of our online subscription content, the research databases we subscribe to so our members can access. And there's a way you can use Google Scholar so that you can find uh, content that you can link to through your State Library membership. Now, if we click on the menu once again, and this time we're gonna select the settings, and then I'll click on this library links option. Now, Google's already identified that I'm currently in Australia, so it's already uh, pre-populated the National Library of Australia for me here. But because I'm a State Library member, I wanna include that in there. So I can just type in SLV for State Library of Victoria, and I'll search for that. And then I can just check that option. Now you can add to up to five libraries. So if you're a, a student and you're a member of a university such as Deakin, you could also add that library in here. But for the moment, I'll just leave it as the state library and I'll save that. And now when it comes back to that series of results, you can see here the article related to Sand Rock Art does have a link, get it at SLV. If I click that link now, it will take us through to the State Library page, which lists all of the sources that are available for that article. And I can see here that it's available on JSTOR uh, through the State Library subscription to that platform. If I click on that, it'll ask me to sign in with my barcode and family name. And I've pre-run this search. It will then take you through to JSTOR and you can read the full article online or you can download a copy of the article in PDF format so that you can read it at your leisure. Now, one other thing I'll quickly mention just in relation to Google Scholar, what we've been looking at so far are articles that appear in journals, but Google Scholar also brings back results from books. So uh, a while ago, Google did a, a large project of indexing and digitizing uh, thousands of books uh, so that that content could be searched. And you can see here, this article here related to Southeastern Sand Rock Art is coming from a books.google.com result. And if I click on that, it will take me through to the Google Books platform. And for most content, because it's still in copyright, all I can see is a limited page preview. So I can have a look at some of the pages that relate to my search. But if you scroll down, you'll see that some of the pages are not available to be previewed. If I want to read the full content, I've got the option of choosing one of these options here to buy the book online. But Google also gives me the option to try and find this book in a library. Now, if I click that, once again, Google has determined that because I'm in Australia, it's likely that I'll want to search through the National Library of Australia. And it takes me to Trove, which allows me to search across the catalogues of many Australian libraries all at the one time. And then I simply need to click on this, get this edition button. And I'm looking for an item that I can borrow or access through a library. And I'm in Victoria, so I'll choose that option. And I can see here that the State Library actually holds a copy of this book. If I'll click on that, it will take us through to the catalogue and show me how I can go about getting access to that book. Um, obviously, we need to wait until the library is reopened, which it's due to do later this month, but uh, you will be eventually able to come in, access that book as part of our collection and read the content that's of relevance to you. Okay, so that's Google Scholar in a nutshell. And now I'll hand back to Andrew to see if we've had any questions come in while we've been doing this. Okay, thanks very much, Marcus. Um, and just a reminder that you can go to Slido to put in questions, but we've got a question there here for you, Tom, which is really just, can you suggest any alternatives to Google and what might be the strengths that they have that Google doesn't have? Certainly, um, can definitely do that, Andrew. I'll just share my screen again so you can have a look. 
All right, here we go. So I've brought up a couple of options here. Um, so uh, you can see the first one on the screen here is DuckDuckGo. So uh, might be one that you mightn't have heard of um, before, but it's it's different or its point of differentiation from Google is it's focused on um, privacy. So some people have concerns about um, companies like Google and Facebook who use a lot of the data collected online to target advertising and things like that, or to um, it's also the basis of the personalization that Google does. So there's definitely pros uh, and cons to those kind of uh, activities, but um, DuckDuckGo doesn't collect any data about um, your searching, so that all of the information uh, is just put in for the search, results are returned and there's nothing else collected. So that's one option if that privacy is something that is important to you. So some others that you might have heard of, um, Bing is uh, Microsoft's um, search engine, so it comes uh, default with lots of Microsoft products. So that's one that you probably might have seen before and is worth giving a go. Another one that's been around for a while is Yahoo, which you might remember. Um, and again, it's uh, like Andrew said, in terms of checking different sources, sometimes it's good to use a couple of different search engines and just see how the results differ to see if there's something um, that's different or of, of interest that you can find through another one. And one other one here that's a little bit different that I've also come across um, called Cozier. Uh, and they, uh, their kind of point of differentiation is that they plant trees um, when there's a certain number of searches made through their website. So they've got a kind of a social justice element to their, uh, to their platform as well. But there's a few options there you could try. Um, and there's, a, there's many more as well. Um, but I think it's, it's best to just give them a go and maybe try a few different ones at the same time and see what the results are and, and see what that tells you about the, the kind of things that you're you're looking for. Um, yeah, hopefully that's good. Back to you, Andrew, see if there's any more questions. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Tom. And uh, Marcus, I think there's one that you might be able to help us with, which is uh, a query about um, Google Images and how you might get the best out of that. Yep, absolutely. Just make sure I'm not on mute. Am I? No, good. Okay, so I'll share my screen. So yeah, if you do a search in Google, obviously it's going to search across everything that's available. And I'm just going to do a search for State Library Victoria. Let's try that spelled correctly. Um, but once you've done a search, there are some subsets that you can then narrow your search down to, one of which is the images search. So if I click on that one now, uh, that's going to return a whole series of images which are related to the keywords that I've searched for. And um, Google is, uh, as Tom was alluding to, using some of its uh, programming logic and its algorithms in order to be able to identify images that relate to the words you've put in there. So the image itself may not have those words directly uh, attributed to it, say as part of the tags or, or some um, you know, other embedded part of the image. Uh, but somewhere on the web page where that image appears, it's likely to have the word State Library of Victoria. Um, so Google uses that to interpret what sort of images are going to be relevant to the search that you're doing. Uh, now, once you've actually got a search up, there are some additional options that you can use to help you narrow down and find specific types of images that you're looking for. If you click on the tools option, you'll see that you get a series of options appearing below here that can be used to refine the type of image you're looking for. So the size will allow you to determine the resolution of the image. So I can say I'm only interested in very large images because I want something that's high resolution that I could use for a publication perhaps. I could specify that I'm after something that's in black and white and that can be quite useful for trying to find historical images. Uh, it's not a guarantee that the image you're looking at was originally a black and white image, but it does help you try and find images from pre-colour photography days. Or you could look for a specific colour and say, you know, I want images that have that as a focus within the, the, um, the content. Usage rights is probably one of the most useful aspects here. That allows you to find images that are safe for reuse. So if you wanted to be able to reuse an item, say, on your own website, you might choose the option to uh, pick items that are labeled for reuse. So Google will use some information pertaining to that image when it was originally uploaded on uh, platforms that allow people to define the reuse conditions. Um, and they will return images that they've been able to identify as safe for reuse without having to get permission from the owner. 
Um, the other option there is safe for reuse with modification, which means you can actually go in and manipulate that image before you reuse it. Um, if you were planning to reuse the item for a you know, local community newsletter or some other non-commercial purpose, then there are these two other options here which allow you to define non-commercial reuse. Um, you've also got type, which allows you to specify a couple of different options there, clip art, line drawing or GIF, which may be useful. Um, but also of relevance can be the time. So uh, as um, Andrew was pointing out with the advanced search, you can apply a date filter to the searches, but it's worth bearing in mind that this doesn't necessarily relate to when the image was first taken. It may relate to when the image was first placed online or some other context around it on the website on which that particular image appears. Um, and if you're looking at an image of a painting, it may not relate to the date of the painting, it may relate to the date that the photo was taken. So using a, um, a date-based filter on images can be a little bit uh, problematic depending on what it is you're actually searching for. Now I'm just going to go back to the default setting here because one of the things you can do, which is really great about the Google image search is you can look for images that appear visually similar to any image that you find. So if I take this image here of the front of the building, if I click on that and drag it up to the top of the screen, it now gives me the option to drop that onto the search bar and it will do a search based on that image. So we're not now looking for images based on keywords. Google is actually interpreting and trying to identify visual aspects of that image and match it to something else in its database that looks similar. And you can see here, it's actually identified that this is a picture of the State Library of Victoria. And down here, it's given me a list of all of the other images which it thinks looks similar. And I can expand that out. And now I've got a whole bunch of images, all of the front of the building, some from different angles, obviously all different photos, but they're all of the same building that looks similar to the one that I originally searched for. All right, I think that'll do for images for now. Back to you, Andrew. Okay, no worries. So I think we're getting very close to uh, time, but we have time for one other quick question, which I'll pick up, which is, to do with Wikipedia and, and people asking how reliable is Wikipedia? Well, I guess the probably simple answer is that it's each entry on Wikipedia is about as reliable as whoever edited that entry. And that's not a very satisfactory answer. The fact is that Wikipedia is ever changing. Um, it has a really strong community of interest that um, update uh, Wikipedia um, articles and anybody can do that. So. I think Wikipedia is fantastic, actually. I think it's one of the great things on the internet, one of the great uses of the internet. It gives people the opportunity to share their expertise with everybody else in the world. Um, and there's, as I say, a really strong body of people who spend a lot of time trying to ensure that the Wikipedia articles are pretty accurate and pretty up to date. But as with anything, as we've talked about throughout this session, it's really up to you to do a bit of checking. So if you find that there's articles in Wikipedia that where someone's put a note saying a citation's needed or where there's just not citations, then you'd be a bit suspicious of that because you can't um, verify that information. But there'll be other articles that are really, really strong and have really good references. Sometimes it's worth checking some of those references and often you can do that online or you can do it through our databases, the things we've spoken about before, just to verify that information. Um, and the other thing you can do is if you find a particular Wikipedia entry that you don't think is quite up to the mark and you've got a bit of uh, knowledge of that area, then why don't you jump in and update that one yourself? And uh, that will make that, that will improve that article for everybody else in the world and it'll allow you to share your knowledge with uh, everybody else in the world. Um, so yeah, I think Wikipedia is great, but as with anything, um, you need to check your sources. You need to use multiple sources, depending on how extensively you're going to use that particular piece of information. Okay, so I think unfortunately we seem to have got very close to running out of time. So thanks uh, everybody for attending today. It's been a lot of fun to do this and we hope you've got something out of it. And this time at next week, uh, three o'clock next week, our online collections will have another webinar for you and check the website. There's lots of other webinars and videos going up there all the time. So there's lots of things to see on there, but uh, for now, um, thank you very much and uh, goodbye from us. <laughs>